No, I am, I am so thankful to be with you all. Wow, what an honor. And I am so thankful to be counted among you all. I think that is the true phrase. Uh, you are an august group of individuals summoned by the Lord here, summoned unto ministry, summoned through the gospel, and it is a privilege to be numbered among you, to be counted among you. Welcome back, and welcome for those of you who are coming back, as well as those of you who are new. I know it's the second week of classes, so on the one hand, we can thank the Lord that he has been so faithful to get you to this point, not only in the semester, but in all the transition and travel and, and all the logistics that take and are required for you to be here. But on the other hand, it is still early in the semester, I realize. And so I just want to extend to you a welcome. And I, my prayer is that this year for you, this semester and year, would be just one where the Lord truly deepens and transforms your life in sanctification unto him and allows you to be more prepared both mentally and in your very spirit and soul for the eternal work of ministry. To that very end, when you think about what to talk about at this early stage of the semester, what can I say, what should I say to exhort and encourage you all? There are a lot of possibilities. It's great. Uh, we can speak of the high calling of the ministry, and indeed that is the case, that we, like Timothy, are called by Paul, called by Scripture, men of God, following in the footsteps of individuals like Paul or Isaiah or Joshua or David or Moses, that succession of a godly line of men summoned at every stage and juncture of redemptive history, that is a high and noble calling, and we can never forget that. We could also talk about the nature of God's grace, that is his not only kindness, that's just the emaciated de de definition of grace, but rather it is the absolute commitment of God to his elect. It is the absolute irresistible power that he wields to affect all that he intends for those whom he has chosen. A good definition of grace is truly the vowels of tulip if you want a good definition of grace. And we have experienced that grace in salvation, that there was a magnificent intervention where we were headed in a collision course with our own damnation and destruction, and God intervened apart from us and saved us and delivered us from his own wrath in his son. And that grace that is so mighty and so effective and so life-giving and death-defying, that grace is what sustains us in ministry, and that is worth thinking about. For that grace is the sufficient grace of God. We could talk about the church. This is the noble institution. In fact, to be truthful and to be factual and objective, the church is the only institution ordained by God for this era. What makes history and what will be known for making history in this moment of history is not the big companies that we think of, our Amazon, our Microsofts, our Apple, or whatever they may be. Those may be flashy for a period of time, but like the book of Ecclesiastes reminds us, they will go the way of dust. There is nothing new under the sun. Only the church in this age will last. That is the institution God has ordained. And when history is retold in the eternal state, that is what will prevail in the end. And therefore, there is nothing more noble, nothing more glorious, nothing more central, nothing of a greater priority than the church. That is what God has established. And therefore, there is nothing that is a greater honor than to be called by the Lord providentially to lead the church, to lead the church. It is an honor to participate in it. It is an honor to lead it. It is an honor to shepherd her. But there is another factor I think that we should contemplate and think about and that is what I'd like to focus on this morning. We could talk about the high calling of ministry, the nature of grace, the nature of the church, but what I'd like to speak on is the word of God, the word of God. That, too, is essential. Everything in ministry is grounded in and stems from and applies the word. That is what defines the church's mission and 
purpose and good. It grounds everything we are and, and our entire ministry. And in, and in fact, the entire role of the church in some is the pillar and grounds of the truth, the protection and the promoter of the truth from generation to generation to generation to generation. And that truth centers upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, your academic time here at the Master Seminary, it is all about the Word of God. And in fact, everything in your seminary experience, everything in our curriculum, all of our positions and our practice and our structure and our curricular organization and our stances is all about sola scriptura. That's what it is. As I was talking with Nathan Boozness one day, we were just meditating on this fact, and, and we said, why are we literal, grammatical, historical? It's simple, because that's sola scriptura in epistemology. Why do we do biblical theology a certain way? It's simple, because that's sola scriptura for the Bible's storyline. Why do we believe in biblical counseling? Simple, because that's sola scriptura in counseling. Why do we have presuppositional apologetics? It's simple, because that's sola scriptura in apologetics. Why do we do expository preaching? That's simple, because that's sola scriptura preaching. Everything you learn here, everything we do here, everything we instill here has a singular purpose. It is for Christ and scripture. It is scripture alone because we are about Christ alone. And that is why we cling to this doctrine so tightly because by its content and by its position, it reminds us that there is no one more sufficient, no other savior, no one at the same level, no one who is at the same pedestal, category, centrality, worthiness, loftiness, power, eternality than the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who defy actively and intentionally the doctrine of sola scriptura, they are intentionally threatening the centrality of Christ. That's why you do that. And we will not allow for that because Christ is our savior, Christ and Christ alone. We are the master's seminary. Let me say that again. We are the master's seminary. We have one master. We serve him. We belong to Christ, and he owns us. And that is why we are about his word alone. And everything in our curriculum and everything in your education and discipleship is meant to instill that conviction and meant to equip you unto and from that conviction so that this word alone, we have it all. We have all that is entailed. Put it this way, the word of God is so rich that it takes three years minimum of so many units to scratch the surface of all that is framed and contained therein. That is how rich the word of God is. And at the end of your time here, you might say, I, don't, I still don't feel like I know a lot. Well, good. Don't ask for a refund just for, just for the rest of your life realize with humility we've just exposed you to the whispers of how great God is the fringes of his ways and the word of God is so deep and so wide our minds as finite as they are can never plumb the depths of it all we are sola scriptura both in position and in practice now to teach this lesson and to really understand this lesson, sometimes it's not good enough just to say it. Our hearts should be captured by that, to be sure, but sometimes it's good to show it. Sometimes it's good to show it. In fact, that's what the scripture does. It not only declares this conviction of sola scriptura, it demonstrates it in a captivating, a pivotal way, a way that's dramatic, a way that shows us how we ought to be and how we ought to live it. As they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so sometimes the scripture gives the picture because it's a thousand words that it says in just a few phrases. And so anytime you become disillusioned and anytime you become distracted and anytime your passion 
for the exclusivity and the singularity of Scripture, the delight of studying it, the, the, the joy of submitting to it, whenever that becomes diluted to any degree or distracted to any degree, remember the picture that we're about to see. Remember that this is what Sola Scriptura looks like, and this is what it's supposed to be in our lives. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Many preachers have labeled this text the preacher and his Bible, the expositor and his Bible. I like that title. I think it's fitting. 2 Timothy 4, 13. Paul writes, when you come, carry to me my cloak, which I left in Troas with Carpus, and the scrolls, particularly the parchments. This phrase might not seem very significant to us, and to really see and understand its full significance, what it's showing, we need to understand what Paul has said. There is no wasted words in 2 Timothy because there are no wasted words in all of Scripture. This is a picture. This is a picture worth a thousand words or more. And to understand what is packed in the picture, we really do need context. And the context will not only amplify the message of what Paul is writing there and the way it was expressed and the way it gripped Timothy and was intended to do so, and therefore the way it should grip us. But the context itself amplifies the very thesis of this message, which is about the nature of the Word of God and Sola Scriptura. We know that 2 Timothy 4 is Paul's last letter. And the question is, when you ever you are faced with writing the last things, the final words is, what do you say? What do you say? What if you knew that you had one final message to your church, one final message to your wife, one final message to your children, what would you tell them? Most likely, you wouldn't say, don't forget to pick up the milk on the way home. You wouldn't say something like that. You tell them the most important thing in your life. You tell them the most important thing for their life. And Paul knew that 2 Timothy 4, or 2 Timothy itself, was his finale. It was his finale. There is a shape to all of Paul's writings. There is a flow and a purpose of every individual letter that he wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit and in their conjunction with each other. There is a shape and a movement to them. He walks them through the fundamentals of worldview in, say, the Thessalonian epistles. And then there are the doctrinal epistles, which walk through the theology of both the gospel and the church. And you can see that in Romans and the Corinthian epistles. And then there are the prison epistles, which walk through ecclesiology and how that should be lived out. And then there there are the pastoral epistles, which walk through the leadership of such ecclesiology. And all of it culminates in the final letter that he wrote in 2 Timothy, and he knew it was his last letter. He says it, and he also demonstrates it by content. For instance, 2 Timothy 1 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. We say, oh, yeah, that's also in Romans. Yes, but it's in 2 Timothy. Why? Because Paul is incorporating Romans into 2 Timothy. It it talks about how we have, we are vessels that could be of wood or clay or gold and silver. And you say, oh, that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Yes, it is, but it's also in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Why? Because Paul is incorporating 1 Corinthians into his final letter. We can hear this, that the gospel and even our faith is according to grace and according to the foreordination of God. And you say, that's Ephesians chapter 2. It is, but it's also quoted in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Why? Because Paul is packing all of his theology of all of his letters into this final letter. 
His eschatology in 1 Corinthians 15 or in 1 and 2 Thessalonians is tucked away in 2 Timothy chapter 4. The accountability of the preacher and of all the church in 2 Corinthians 5 is found in 2 Timothy chapter 3. All of his theology is packed into 2 Timothy. It is a concise summary of all Paul's theology and ministry, and there is a purpose in that, and we are familiar with it. 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, what you have heard from me and trust the faithful men who will likewise do the same. Paul had set up an entire theology in the providence of God and in the inspiration of the Spirit to culminate in 2 Timothy in one package, and his message was, take everything that I have taught you, everything that is embodied in this book and thereby extends to all of his inspired writings and pass it on to generation so that the next generation will have it and pass it on to the subsequent generation and the following generation after them. That is Paul's ministry. It was intentioned to be a legacy. There are some who think, well, maybe Paul's writings and Paul's ministry and Paul's philosophy and Paul's theology was just meant for his generation. Those there, not true. By his very intention, by his very strategy, by the very flow and shape of his epistles and their purpose, he meant to write something not just for his time, but for all time. And that is what shapes our own ministry and life. Now, having said that 2 Timothy is this climactic capstone epistle, the summary of all of Pauline thought and ministry, Here's what's absolutely fascinating. You don't have many chapters to write. You don't have a lot of space to talk. You have to pack in a lot and a little. And it's fascinating that he just keeps going back to the word of God. Every single chapter, the word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1, hold fast to sound words. That's allegiance, allegiance. Then 2 Timothy 2.15, what does he say? Rightly divide the word of God truth. That's how you handle the word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 16, all scripture is God breathed. That is about our convictions of the word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 4, what does he say? He says, preach the word. That's the proclamation of the word of God. Every single chapter, every single discussion, every single moment and juncture that he has opportunity for, he brings Timothy back to the word of God, telling him to uphold the truth, telling him how to handle the truth, telling him to hold it fast, and telling him to hold it forth. This is an unrelenting, unflinching, constant pervasive, immersive grip on the word of God. That's what consumed Paul. And if you want to understand then, if you want to understand then the core of Paul's ministry, what he truly was about and what clinches it all for him, it is Christ and his word. There is no center other than that. And that's what he impressed upon Timothy by going over and over repeatedly again and again back to the scripture in his final letter. That is his legacy to Timothy. That is his legacy to us. But like I said, it's one thing to say it. It's abstract. Oh, yes, I'm supposed to know that the word of God is important. I'm supposed to know that the word of God is central. I'm supposed to handle it a certain way, have convictions about it, preach it, etc. But how serious is Paul about this? And what does that really look like? Paul, Paul doesn't just say the answer. He shows it. Often we can fall into a Sunday school answer mentality. Everyone knows in Sunday school the answers are always the same. You ask a question, the answer is going to be Jesus. It's going to be the Bible. It's going to be praying. You know, and we make fun of that and and it's true. On one hand, what other kinds of questions are you really going to ask to provoke different questions? Like, who tempted Jesus in the wilderness? The Bible. No, like you can't do that. I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense. We're not going to say something like that. I get it. Uh, by the way, I mean, we do this even in seminary. That's what I joke with some of the Hebrew professors because the Old Testament has so many synonyms for striking and violent acts. Most likely, from a statistical perspective, if you put hit, strike, beat, 
on a Hebrew vocab exam, you probably will get it right. Um, just FYI, in case you need some help. We, we know how to give rote answers. We're very good at it. And Paul knew that. And Paul not only knew that, he just knew that he believed what he believed. And so he didn't just say to Timothy, the word of God matters. He showed it to him. He showed it to him. And that's what 2 Timothy 4.13 is about. Paul's on death row. And Paul has just told Timothy in context, I'm about to die. Come and see me before I go to be with Christ. Let's have one last meeting. And he gives a lot of personal instructions. This is Paul being very human and very transparent, having established such a grave and serious situation. And the question is, what does Paul want? You're on death row. You're going to die. What does Paul want? And here is Paul's overwhelming message to Timothy. Give me my Bible. Give me my Bible. I'm dying. This place is terrible. It's degrading. I'm wasting away. Here's what I need. Give me my Bible. That's what I want most of all. Brothers, we can talk about sola scriptura all day, and we should. That's what it's supposed to look like. A picture is worth a thousand words, and my job this morning with you all is to tease out what is encased in that picture of a man on death row, condemned to die, wasting away, emaciated, degrading in every sense, right in front of your eyes. And what he begs for is, give me my Bible. That's not just sola scriptura said. That's sola scriptura shown. And so I want to talk about three attitudes that Paul has in this moment that he, under inspiration, perfectly articulates in Verse 13 of 2 Timothy 4, three attitudes that help us to understand what, what, how we should be with our own Bible. The preacher, the expositor, the apostle, and his Bible. The first attitude is need. Need. You need your Bible. And Paul outlines the situation that faces him. He has a cloak. It, he said, I left it in Troas with Carpus. And Troas is a place where there was a lot of sea traffic. It was a harbor city. And in essence, you could say that his the situation is no different in a way from when your kids or we say, oh, I left such and such at so-and-so's house. I left such and such here or there or the other. That is what Paul is referring to, that he has left things at a certain location and Timothy needs to pick them up before before coming to him. That's true, but we need to tease this out a little bit. And Troas is a key piece of that puzzle. Like I said, it is a harbor city. But if you read the book of Acts, you will notice that Paul does not spend a lot of time in that town. And there's a reason for that because it's a harbor city. It's a place of transit. It's a place of transition. And so he's just moving rapidly through that city to get to somewhere else. And so there wasn't a lot of ministry activity necessarily early on in the book of Acts at that place. And likewise, you have this individual named Carpus. And Carpus is not a Jewish name. It is a Gentile name. And so this is all pointing to the fact by virtue of how the church would have grown here and that its Gentile reach and influence would have taken place here, that this, is, this event 
Whatever Paul was talking about when he left it happened later on in his life and ministry. This is not talking about something in the book of Acts. It's far too early for these kinds of developments that are implied here to be taking place. This is something that happened way, way later. And you say, okay, but so what? Why does that matter? Is this just a nerdy conversation? Well, no, this has a point. Because the only reason why he would have left that those materials there, especially things that he needed, was that he didn't have a choice. This is when, most likely, he was seized. He was arrested after the book of Acts has taken place in his subsequent missionary journeys outside of the book of Acts. This is when he was captured and led, therefore, to Rome to go to death row. He was seized at this gentleman's house named Carpus in the place called Troas. And so this isn't just like a little kid saying, oh, I left my flashlight at so-and-so's house. Can you pick it up? Paul has basically said, you know where I was arrested. I was arrested there. And that's where I left all my belongings, all my worldly possessions. And so think about everything you own. What's the one thing you pick that you need? That's the situation Paul is in. He has left everything he owns, all that he possesses, at one place. He has directed Timothy to go to that place to retrieve whatever is most necessary. And it's similar to the question that we face sometimes of, hey, if your house is on fire, what's the one thing or the two things, assuming you've already you know, liberated your wife and children and everything like that, but what's the, what's the, what are the possessions you would bring out what would you choose? That's what Paul has here. It's just not hypothetical. It's real. And whatever he chooses, it reflects this. That is what is most important, what is most essential, what is necessary. He not only needs this, he needs it now. It can't wait. He can't do without it. It is massive. It is life or death. He will have major setbacks without it. He is completely dependent upon it. It's desperate. It's the first thing in his mind. That's the kind of question that this situation sets up for. That's the kind of necessity. That's the kind of need. That's the kind of direness and urgency to the situation. And so what might you need? And to illustrate, he says, how about a cloak? A cloak. And on paper, a cloak sounds pretty unimpressive. Here's a description. It's a big leather poncho. I never liked ponchos growing up or even to this day. They're weird. They're unwieldy. They're made of plastic. They stick to you. They feel yucky. They just make the rain even more yucky. Why? What, what is up with this big leather poncho? And to be sure, that's an apt description. It's a large, heavy garment, singular piece of material, material made of wool or coarse hide or coarse hair, and it covered the entire body, and there was a hole in the middle of this garment, and you would put it over your head. And so, yes, it's a big leather poncho. Now, while it may sound unimpressive on paper, let's be really clear. That leather poncho for people at that time was vital was vital because it was a single piece of material heavy and solid it secured you from all the elements you you would wear it to keep warm you would wear it to keep dry you would wear it over your clothes so that they wouldn't rip and degrade it therefore kind of acted as your jacket which you always wore and always had with you. And in fact, you just wouldn't wear it in the morning. You would wear it at night because that acted as the perfect blanket and the perfect mattress, so to speak, so that you could sleep in it. And so this item wasn't just a poncho like we have nowadays where it's this plastic thing and you wear it for one second and you realize it's not worthwhile and it's actually making you more uncomfortable and then you just throw it away or use it as a trash bag. That is not this thing. 
This is what you wear inside. This is what you wear outside. This is what you wear when you're awake. This is what you wear when you're asleep. You have this with you everywhere and at all times because it protects you from all the elements. That's what it is. And because this poncho, quote unquote, is so durable and made from a singular piece of animal hide, it is expensive. You can't make this on the cheap. You cannot stitch this thing together. It's going to fall apart and defeat its very purpose and functionality. You're going to destroy it if you had one of these. And therefore, it had to be made out of a singular piece of material. It was very expensive to produce. And you most likely had one in your entire life that you kept with you for your entire life. That's how expensive it is. You needed it everywhere. You needed to take it with you wherever you go. And that would especially be the case when you're in prison. Especially, especially the case when you're on death row, where it's cold and dark and damp. Paul, by tradition, and it's pretty good to think through this, and at least it's good to illustrate it here, was held perhaps in the Marmotine prison, and you can look that up later uh, after chapel or such on the internet. And when you look at this place, you realize very quickly it's a dark, dismal place. There's no ventilation, so in the summer, it's hot and miserable. And in the other times of year, it can be humid and damp. It was filthy. There was squalor everywhere. And, in, and the conditions were such that historians record that people's clothes would just wear away. People's clothes would just wear away, and people would starve in these places. Their health would immediately start to degrade. And Roman historians note that people awaiting death in this prison often never met the executioner because most died in prison. Most died in prison. The prison was so terrible. There were atrocious conditions. You couldn't sleep. There was sleep deprivation because the place was so uncomfortable. Both temperature and hygiene are the lack thereof. And the floor, you couldn't be on the floor because of how uncomfortable it was. Everything. You can't sleep. And even when you're awake, you're just, your body is wasting away. And Paul's in that place. And let's not forget this. He's a human. He's a man. He's normal in that way. And so, of course, logically, rationally, out of all the possessions you have, out of all the assortment of items you would own, what do you want? What do you need? Get me the cloak. Because why? Once you have that cloak, it's instant relief. From the elements. Your clothes are falling apart. You're being scratched and, and, and hurt by all the surroundings around you. You're being chafed by and, and you're feeling the cold and all the miserable conditions. You want instant relief? You get that cloak, you will have it. It will protect you. You could actually get a little bit of sleep at night because that's something that you would have to, to sleep in. You, there would be familiarity and relief and comfort that way, that way. It would be a little bit. Maybe it wouldn't solve everything and it would start to rejuvenate your health because now the elements are no longer degrading against you. You can get rest and you can recover. This cloak, this poncho, it would be a hospital it would be medicine, it would be a shelter, it would be a comfort, all in one, all in one. People in those days, all they could think about was having something to wear in prison. That's all they were reduced to. That was their mental state. And Paul says, of course. And Timothy and all of his companions would say, of course. That's what you need. That's life and death. You can feel the urgency. You can feel how much this would help. You can feel the amount of comfort and relief and the desperation for it. And on one hand, this is a reminder to us of how much Paul suffered for the gospel and the sufficiency of God's grace and that we don't need to fear even the toughest of times. God got Paul through 
even that. But on the other hand, here's what's absolutely fascinating. Paul, in Greek, uses just two words to describe his cloak. And then he spends the rest of the sentence describing what? His Bible. And here's what he told Timothy. Timothy, of course I need a cloak. That would be a hospital. That would be medicine. That would be instant relief. That would start to prevent my health from just completely going off the deep end. That would give me some sort of rest. And everyone, after being in a prison like this for any period of time, would be desperate to have it. And he says, but I want my Bible more. My Bible is more important than what I need. And this, brothers, is the conviction that Paul had. He needed his Bible more than what he needed to need. That's Paul. It reminds me of Psalm 63. David is writing on his wilderness trek to flee from Saul. And he says, Lord, I pant after you. I thirst after you and implied your word. He even talks about that later on in Psalm 63. In a land without water. Now, did you catch that? There's no water in this region. And sometimes when I take Ibex students or students in Israel on a, on a short hike, we're hiking up this trail in, in around En Gedi uh, where there are some springs, but I don't take them by those springs just yet. And, and we're hiking up this back trail, and it's hot, and it's miserable, and, you know, we're all Americans, so we're just, oh, just trying to trudge up this place, and no one really wants to do it. No one knows if there's a purpose to this or if it's just, you know, educational hazing. And, 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 and why are we doing this? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they hear, they hear a trickle of water. And I can't describe it in this way, but I hope it makes sense. It just sounds cold. It sounds cold and refreshing. It sounds better than air conditioning at the moment. And all of a sudden, all the students, like clockwork, they pick up their pace. And they start walking faster, trying to trace the sound. And then they see it, a spring, right in the middle of this desert, arid area. And it's pumping out clean water. And it's been doing that for a long, long time, even before the time of David. It's been pumping out this crisp and clean water. And all the students, particularly the guys, they run into the water and they start splashing it and drinking it. It's totally safe. And they're so happy. They're laughing. And all the girls are like, ew, you're gross. And all, all your sweat's in the water. And, but here's the beauty of it. It's a spring. It cleans out within a couple minutes, and it's pure and fresh, and everyone is so happy, and everyone is so joyful, and everyone is so encouraged. And then you open up Psalm 63, and what does David say? I'm not even thirsty for that. I'm thirsty for God. Brothers, we need the Bible more than what we need we need. That's what Paul showed. Paul said, I'm dying here. If you could get me a cloak, that would help. But what I need more than that is my Bible. Give me my Bible. Brothers, the Bible for us and even for our people cannot be just a hobby. It cannot be just a curiosity. I'm just interested in this thing. For us, it cannot be just one of your many interests that you list on a social media page because the Bible is not just one of many. It's not just something we fiddle around with or peruse or investigate or analyze. The Bible is what we need more than what we need. That's what our attitude has to be. And when we are not in the word of God, we feel it. We understand we are disconnected from our source of spiritual food and we languish because we've been disconnected from this. We feel that more than when we don't eat or drink. We feel a disconnection and emaciation when we do not have our spiritual food in the word of God. What we must understand and what Paul demonstrated here is that the Bible 
The Bible is what you need more than what you need. That's why we do what we do. We are desperate to have it and cannot live without it. That's what we must remember. Paul said, and remember the man in death row. Cloak is useful. Everyone understands how desperate that would be. Everyone understands how helpful it would be. And Paul says, but give me my Bible. That's what I really want. That's what I really need. The Bible is what you need. Furthermore, second, you need all your Bible. You need all of your Bible. That's the second point. Notice the next words. Bring to me not only the cloak, but the scrolls. The scrolls. What's a scroll? Well, it's a roll of writing material, often papyrus, but it could also be all kinds of material, as we'll see. It could be animal skills, skins and vellum and the like. And the word can also be used abstractly to denote what is composed or the content of what is written upon these physical writing materials. And so that's why sometimes it's translated as a book or a volume. And in Scripture, whether you're dealing with the physical scroll or whether you're dealing with what it abstractly contains, there is a predominant usage that it is talking about Scripture. Galatians 3.10, Hebrews 9.19, this is the book of the law. The scroll of Isaiah is mentioned in Luke chapter 4, verse 17 and 20. The scroll that is describing prophecies is, is discussed in Hebrews chapter 10, and the book of Revelation is mentioned in Revelation 1, 11. And so sure, sure, to be fair, could these scrolls be blank? Could these scrolls contain Paul's personal correspondence? Could these scrolls contain a lot of different records or the like for Paul? Yes, for the sake of argument, they could. But the entire usage of scripture on this word, and in fact, as we will see shortly enough, the very practice of people at this time, because these scrolls were so expensive, was to preserve one thing and to focus on one thing alone, and that's the Bible. That's the Bible. Now, within this, notice that Paul says, give me not just a scroll, give me what? The scrolls plural, and that's important. It's pretty simple for Timothy. You go to my house, or you go to Carpus's house, and you just find every single scroll, and you bring it to me. That helps. What it also accentuates is this. What's the only book that Paul really owned? His Bible. He wasn't just believing in sola scriptura. His possessions were sola scriptura. The guy was sola scriptura. Because it was so important to him. And the phrase, the books, or the phrase, the scrolls, is a phrase even in the Old Testament, and for specifically the Greek translation of the Old Testament, for the entire Old Testament. Paul said, bring me, bring me my Bible. Bring me the whole Old Testament. And in fact, because at that time, uh, people have recorded that individuals like Paul, if they knew that they were writing scripture, may have kept a carbon copy of their writings. It may have even included his epistles to different churches as well. And so what you have is the canon henceforth formed. He says, bring that to me. Bring that to me. He didn't just want part of his Bible. He wanted all of it. He wanted all of it. And that's an important truth. There are extremes where people want to unhitch from the Old Testament. We are aware for that. And before we criticize that, we have to understand that sometimes people, they just want to pick and choose. You know, there was one preacher who said, you know, the church nowadays is the church of the seven commandments, and you get to pick them. And on top of that, people just say, oh, I just need my go-to verses. I got Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, John 3, 16, Romans 8, 28, and that's about it. And that's all that they think they need. Why else do you need a rest of your Bible when you can have four verses? And before we criticize them, seminarians, they believe this too. They just, they just code it with you know, more theological vernacular. They say, I understand why I have to study Greek, but why Hebrew? You know, it looks like worms smashed on a page. Why do I have to do this? And then they say, why do I have to study that doctrine? It's so obscure. Why do I have to study that truth? It's so limited. I don't understand the moment you start to say that, what you're saying is, 
I just don't need parts of my Bible. I don't need the whole Bible. I just need some of it. What did Paul say? Give it all to me, Timothy. Paul knew that he not only needed his Bible, he needed all of it in his life. Every single thing and every single book and every single passage, it matters. And we could just walk through some, and let me just give you some right now, just to be a little bit illustrative of this. Why do you need the book of Genesis? Nowadays, if you don't have the book of Genesis, you don't even know what a woman is. That's where we're going. And why do you need Exodus to understand salvation? Why do you need Leviticus to know the holiness of God? Why do you need Numbers to understand how God refines and disciplines? Why do you need Deuteronomy to know the love of God? Why do you need Joshua to know that God will conquer the world? Why do you need Judges and Ruth and First and Second Samuel to know that redemptive history is moving to the Messiah, to the Lord Jesus Christ? Why do you need Isaiah to understand the plan of God and the gospel and how that will triumph? And Ezekiel, the presence of God, and you need the gospels to understand the gospel and Acts, the church, and Ephesians and Philippians and James and Hebrews to take our stand as the church in doctrine and for Christ and in our testimony. And the list can go on and on and on and on and on. Every single book, every single passage of scripture is unique. It is all different. It is all purposed by God. It is all profitable. And therefore, it is all necessary. And therefore, because it is all necessary for all life and godliness to face every single challenge, aspect, trial, problem, question, situation, activity, dilemma, difficulty, as well as any kind of issue of our existence, you need all of this. Not just some, all. And Paul, in his dying days, he didn't just have one passage he needed to go to. He needed to go to his Bible. He needed it all. And he said, Timothy, bring it all. I need it all. Remember the man on death row. He did not just go to one text. He went to the text. He had it all. Brothers, he had just told Timothy in the previous chapter, all scripture is God-breathed and what? Profitable. And then what does he do? He lives it. So bring me all my Bible. Bring me the whole. The whole of the Bible is inspired. So bring me my whole Bible. Not just one scroll, every scroll. Timothy, I need them all. Bring them to me, brothers. We are whole Bible expositors. Here at the Master Seminary, we are trained so that every book and every passage and every verse and every word flows through our veins. That if you prick us, we bleed Bible. And we are ready to minister that all-sufficient truth in its totality to our people. There are people out there depending on you and me to be that way. Don't forget the man in prison. Don't forget the man on death row. When it was the darkest time, he said, I need my Bible, and I need it all. I need it all. Give it all to me. That's what he wanted. Finally, you don't just need your Bible. You don't just need all your Bible. It is your treasure. Your Bible is your treasure. Paul says to Timothy, bring me the scrolls, particularly or especially the parchments. What does it mean, especially the parchments? What does especially mean? It can denote a subset of the whole. For example, greet everyone with a holy kiss, especially those of Caesar's household, Philippians chapter 4.22. Yes, it can be a part of the whole. But even in doing that, the way Paul particularly used the word was that he isolated a part to emphasize something characteristic of the whole, something that was true of the whole, something that defined the whole, something that described the whole. For example, 1 Timothy 5.17, that elders are worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and teaching. What do we know about elders? They're supposed to be what? Laboring in the word and teaching. What is about the part should really describe and characterize and define the whole. Titus 1.10, we know that there are many rebellious, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Those of the circumcision, yeah, they're the part of the whole, but they define and they describe and they illustrate and characterize and embody the whole. And for that very reason, in 1 Timothy 4.10, yes, 
Christ is the savior of all men, especially those who believe. We can talk about common grace from this text, amen and amen. And even more, the designation that he is the savior of all men denotes not exhaustiveness as much as it does exclusivity, that there is no other one but the Lord Jesus Christ. But within that, notice the language. If he is the savior of all men, especially those who believe, then the ones who truly have such salvation, the ones who are fully that way, the ones who have it comprehensively and in totality are those those who what? Believe. And that is what defines and describes what all actually means. And in the same logic here, when he says, particularly the parchments, there is something about the parchments that characterizes, defines, and describes everything about the scrolls, everything about the Bible. And that is simply this. It is a treasure. It is a treasure. You see, term parchments reminds Timothy that the Bible's expensive. Even today, we have expensive Bibles, not just the rare antiques. Those are expensive. We have some here by God's kindness. But you can have an expensive Bible. People go on the internet, and, and Bible nerds, they, they look for the kind of leather. They say, oh, goatskin, cowskin, lambskin, or sometimes people even select kangaroo. And then they select the color, and they select how many ribbons, and whether it's going to have spinal hubs, and they're going to talk about the binding of it, and the style of it, and the layout of it. It's the only time Bible nerds like to shop. That's what we have when we talk about selecting a Bible, and it's pricey when you get that Bible. It's pricey. And so people don't just throw the thing around. They handle it with care because it's hundreds of dollars. And so we treat it that way. It's precious and it's valuable. We may have leather. Back then, they had parchment. They had parchment. And just to put it in perspective, the book of Romans, some people calculate to produce, would be bare minimum $3,000, $4,000. The Torah, just the first five books of the scripture, might cost two to three million dollars minimum. This is not an inexpensive or cheap Bible. Paul is reminding, don't you know, Timothy, this is expensive. This is a treasure. And on the one hand, yes, such a reality reminds us about the nature of preservation of scripture. That, yeah, you might have a document written in 300 AD, but because people weren't just throwing away their Bibles every single day or changing them out every time they wanted to read through the Bible in a new year, they preserve this because you, unless you have thousands or millions of dollars to spend every year on a Bible. And if you do, please come see me after this message. But if, if you don't, you would preserve it. And so a reading in one manuscript in 300 AD would reflect the hundreds of years and multi-generations that a Bible was passed down over and over time and would push back the reading all the way into the BC period and such. But even more than that, there's a fundamental reality. What else would you preserve if you didn't believe that this Bible meant something? If you didn't believe that this Bible was inspired, you would never bother to spend thousands or millions of dollars preserving it unless you believe with your whole heart this was worth preserving. And the fact that the Bible is so well preserved is itself an illustration that people knew instantly from the beginning this is the word of God. And it's worth investing every penny for. It is worth upholding. It is worth preserving. And it's for that very reason in the time of the Greco-Roman era, such a term like the parchments came to be synonymous with the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament. Why? Because what else would you write down than what is most important, designed to be upheld, designed to be passed on from generation to generation, something so vital, something so critical and crucial? What else would you put down there but your Bible because it's that way? And so, of course, the word became synonymous because that is the most important book. And Paul reminds Timothy, that's the point. This is the most important book. Brothers, we don't just get, we don't just have to study the word of God. I know it's assigned to you here. I know you, you won't do so hot on your GPA if you don't study you get to study the Bible. This is a treasure. This, is, this isn't just a, some necessity thing that we have to do. This is 
the most beautiful, the most refreshing, the most wonderful, the most delightful, that which sustains us in trials and takes us up to the God that we love and takes us up to the Savior who died for us. This is sweeter than honey. This is I love your law. This is my meditation day and night. This is what revives us. This is what we feed upon. This is our treasure. We don't just have to study our Bible. We get to. We get to. And the danger of sometimes in ministry is that we just get fixated on so many things, the Bible becomes a drudgery. Remember the man in prison. Remember the man in prison. He said, Timothy, this is my greatest treasure. This is my greatest possession. This is my only legacy. It's my Bible. This is all I care about. This is what I love. This is what I need. It's my Bible. Brothers, we should not be the most joyful and have the most happiness when we have ministry fame or we're in the pulpit in front of crowds of people. The Lord will use these things, and he, if he grants them to you, of course, we are thankful. Our greatest joy is when we are in our study with our Bible because that's our greatest treasure, because he is our greatest treasure. And if your heart is not there, remember the man on death row. He said, give me my Bible. Particularly, don't forget, Timothy, it's the treasure of my life. In ministry, brothers, there is an unrelenting pace, not only at the seminary, but in the church, to prepare and to preach and to disciple. And when you feel overwhelmed and when you feel numb, when you just want to do things to get by and get done with the message or finish an exegetical project just to check it off your list, remember the man on death row. He didn't just declare to us sola scriptura. He was embodying sola scriptura. Because he said, out of anything, just give me my Bible. All of it and all of it alone. And may that be our heart's cry. Shall we pray? Our God and Father, thank you for the Apostle Paul whom you raised up. You raised him up in his writing and you raised him up in his example. And may we be so desperate for the word of God. May we be those who, are, who desire it all in our heart. May we understand that this is our greatest treasure and our joy is not to show off in front of crowds, but to be alone with you in the study. And that is our happy place because we are in the word, which is a treasure. And ultimately it brings us to the greatest treasure of all. And that is you and your son. May our love for you be undying and therefore our commitment to your word be unrelenting. And we ask all this, not for our own sake, but to honor the one who died for us and to love him and to know him with all of our heart and our mind and our soul. Be with us, O God, this year unto these ends. For the sake of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.